Hi, welcome to Reading Greek Tragedy Online. I'm Joel Christensen coming to you from Brandeis University, and I'm here with the Center for Hellenic Studies, the Cosmos Society, Out of Chaos Theater, and our special guest, Emma Cole. Today we're bringing to you a uh, new version of the Buckeye, a musical um, that's been pre-recorded to get some special effects in there um, by Joanna, Johanna Warren and Jay Langdon Marcus. Um, before then, though, we want to talk a little bit about the play, about why we're doing this again, and where we've been for the past four or five months or so. As some of you may remember, we started this pro project way back in the beginning of the pandemic in March of 2020, trying to give each other space to talk about Greek tragedy, to reflect on our experiences um, in a world that's increasingly confusing and challenging. Along the way, we've done over 40 episodes, bringing us to now what we're calling season three. Later on today, we'll talk a bit about what season three is going to include. But let's just focus right now on this play, The Bacchae. We've performed it before. I've translated it before myself. I've been involved in performances. And each time, um, this play challenges me in a different way. Um, so that's why I'm really happy to have Emma here today, um, who has brilliant ideas about the play and hopefully can help me understand it just a little more. Emma, how are you doing? I'm doing brilliant. Thanks. How are you, Joel? I'm doing OK. Um, is it past dinner time there? It is. It's um, well, for, for those of us with small kids, it's definitely past <laughs> dinner time. It's 8 p.m. So. All right. So ho hopefully it, it's bedtime, too. Yeah. Uh, for them. Um, so uh, let's set the stage a little bit. What do you think people need to know when they're coming to the Buckeye for the first time? So the Buckeye is an incredible tragedy. It's one of my favorites. And if someone has never read it before, I think a few kind of really important things to know are that it was performed for the very first time posthumously. So Euripides, the playwright, had already passed away. And that means there's a lot that we don't know about when it was written is this the last play he ever wrote or is this kind of the equivalent of something that was found in a desk drawer that could have been written at any point in his career? We really don't know. We also don't know where it was written. Uh, Euripides spent the last couple of years in his, of his life in exile in Macedon, so he could have written it away from Athens or he could have written it earlier and been based within Athens. So there's a lot of mystery surrounding it and how we choose to answer the kind of questions that are surrounding this play can affect how we interpret it and the meaning that we see in the play. So it's a really great opportunity of a text to um, be able to experiment with and read it in different ways, depending on what answers we see about when it was written or where it was written. Another really key thing I think that's worthwhile knowing is that it was an amazing musical text when it was first written. And I'm really excited to hear that the production that we're going to be viewing together this evening is a musical adaptation. Uh, so all, all Greek tragedy was a form of kind of musical theatre, if you like, because we have this wonderful institution of the chorus who would sing lyrics during the performances. Um, but Bacchae has really quite a high percentage of lyric content for a Greek tragedy. Um, so it's got about 28% um, of the text, which is written in lyric, which is on the high side for a Greek tragedy. So it's a very musical number already. And we've got various cues in the play as well, which hint that it was maybe more instrumental than other texts as well. Uh, so Greek tragedy was usually accompanied by the aulos, a kind of uh, ringed instrument, a bit like an oboe, if you like. Um, but this play, we get insight in the text that the chorus might have had drums as well. So there are a couple of different references to the chorus appearing with drums and also the chorus talking about drumming. So it seems that this was a text which not only had more sung content, which is what the lyrics indicate, but maybe more instruments in it as well. So there's definitely a lot of really exciting opportunities for modern performance when we come to this text, depending on how we interpret it and what we do with all these invitations for musical realization as well. So, I mean, and we know that lots of Greek, tra most Greek tragedy had a lot of music any in it anyway. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm wondering if, if you'd make some connection between uh, the degree of musicality in this play um, and its time of performance. Do you want to tell us a little more about, about when you think it was performed and how it sort of shapes the interpretation of the play? Of course. So we, we do have a date for this play, approximately 405 BC. So that's the first time it was performed. And that's actually quite a key date in terms of musical innovation in the ancient world. 
Uh, so there was a phenomenon which started to be introduced probably around 430 BC, so a little bit before this play was written, which is now known today as ancient new music. Uh, it wasn't called that at the time, but that's that's what scholars have decided to attribute it. Um, that's a label that scholars attribute to it now. And ancient new music was um, a phenomenon which saw a huge degree of experimentation in the ancient world. So we start to see much more complex scales. We see more complex forms of rhythm. Uh, we also start to see kind of freer forms of verse being written as well. And now we don't have any of the musical annotation that Euripides wrote for this play that survives. We've only got the lyrics, um, which we can read the metre from. But we know that Euripides was famous for being one of the key driving forces in this new music phenomenon. Um, people often ridiculed him at the time. Uh, another play that was written in 405 or first performed in 405 BC, Aristophanes Frogs, um, pokes fun quite a lot at Euripides and what he was doing with music in the ancient world. Uh, but, you know, Euripides has the last word because by the third century BC, all music was what we know of as ancient new music. So he was really one of the great innovators when it comes to music. And this play at 405 BC, it's really at the kind of tipping point where ancient new music starts to become a really big thing and becomes more recognisable. And we have um, an ancient scholia, um, or scholion rather, which talks about a couple of centuries later, someone performing part of the back eye, a musician performing part of the back eye as um, the equivalent of an encore. And so this is just coming out and playing something and being applauded for it, which indicates that the music in the back eye became so famous that it was recognizable even without the lyrics. People could hear a tune, a melody from this tragedy and it became so influential that people would recognize it and it could just be performed by a musician as an encore. So that date is quite important in terms of the, the musical innovations going on in the ancient world. So, and, and that's fascinating thinking about like, what well, which of the songs in this would have been the hit single, right? That mm -hmm. people, people would have heard. Um, but what about the content of the play? Where are we sort of mythologically and plot wise at the beginning of that play? And does it have any relation to, to the innovation in music that you're talking about? So I'm not sure if I would necessarily connect the two, um, but mythologically we're set in Thebes in this play and we are talking about a, a different Thebes to the one that some people might know um, where Oedipus is based. In this play, we've got King Pentheus who is sitting on the throne uh, and his mother Agave or Agave and we see Dionysus coming in from the east and some of the women in Thebes are becoming interested in the Dionysiac rituals and religion and go off into the mountains and follow Dionysus and Pentheus starts to, to get anxious about what's going on um, and doesn't believe in worshipping Dionysus. And we see what happens when he denies the power of Dionysus and refuses to submit to this god and to worship this god. And that's the kind of content that's going on in this play. So it's set in the mythological past. Uh, we're seeing um, characters who are much closer to the gods in terms of tracing their familial ancestry. Um, but we are engaging with rituals and forms of religion that were practiced in the time in which it was set. And I suppose to answer your question about the link between the content and the music, that's perhaps where we could see a connection because there was a, a religious ritual every two years in the ancient world where Greek women would go to the mountains and would do this kind of ritual reenactment of, of the worshippers of Dionysus and it's possible that maybe some of the the songs that the chorus sing in the Bacchae maybe were linking to or echoing the hymns that might have been part of that religious ritual so although it's set in the mythological past there could be musical connections with religious practice from the the contemporary time in which it was first written in the fifth century. 
So in thinking about the contemporary time, one of the things uh, that I usually bring to this is I, I think of the Bacchae as being rather late. As a Homerist, uh, my perspective is completely skewed. Um, but I always, you know, I think about the the environment in which he uh, Euripides composed it, so during the Peloponnesian War, um, and it coming near the end of a period. I don't know how how conscious ancient audiences were of their endings going on here. Aristophanes certainly was. But can you tell me something about what why you think that Euripides may have been attracted to this particular topic um, near the end of his career? There is a, a lot of debate that goes on within scholarship about Euripides's attitude towards religion um, and whether whether he was an atheist or not. And some people do look at the Bacchae as maybe um, an answer to that question about how, how Euripides thought about religion and maybe showing that he was starting to become a little bit more deferential to the gods through this play. Um, so you could possibly look at his, his attitude towards the gods and his acceptance um, or cautionary tale about denying the gods, perhaps we could say, in this play as, as maybe linking towards that, that contemporary context. But then again, I guess it, it does raise the question of, of exactly what year this play was written. And if it was written right before 405 BC, then it is very closely obviously tied to exactly what was going on at the end of the Peloponnesian War and that timing. But if it was written earlier, perhaps it doesn't hold so true. Um, what we, what I guess we can say more more certainly in terms of, of the context of the play is that within that, that history of musical innovation, rather than the politics of fifth century Athens, within the history of musical innovation, he was perhaps more liberated and more free at this later stage in his life. And he was doing much more experimentation than he had ever done before. So we could maybe say that if he's writing this play at the end of his life, Maybe he's got a little bit more of a um, carefree attitude, though I don't know if Euripides was ever particularly deferential to um, no, no. <laughs> dramatic um, precedents and whatnot. Yeah. But he's certainly got no holds barred in this play um, when it comes to methods of dramatic composition. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that I often, I always leave out in these episodes is that these plays have d several different types of contexts, right? They're part of a ritual context of the city Dionysia, um, but they also are part of tetralogies. There were other mm -hmm. plays that were performed um, that could have radically reshaped the way that they were received. Um, so for this play, in fact, I, I always ignore it. I just see the Bacchae as a standalone. Can you tell us a little more about the other plays that were positioned with it and how their contents may have shaped the reception? Absolutely. So uh, as you said, there, were, there are tetralogies that were staged. So we have four plays that each dramatist would enter into the city Dionysia and they would enter them for a cash prize. So there's, there's something riding on this. And Euripides infamously didn't do very well in this dramatic contest. So there would be three tragedians who would enter the plays each year. And Euripides um, didn't often win, um, but the Bacchae is an exception. This play or the tetralogy that it was, of which it was a part, it did win first prize. And the, the plays that accompanied it, there would be three tragedies of which the Bacchae was one, and then a satire drama as well, um, which was a, a different genre of performance, which would have a chorus of satires, um, often um, messing with myth and poking fun at myth and doing um, interesting forms of revelry on stage. The, the tragedies that accompanied the Bacchae were called Iphigenia at Aulis, which survives in full. So we have that play and then a play called Alcmaeon in Corinth, which only survives in fragments. But we do have a summary about what that play told, about the myth that that play told. And Alcmaeon in Corinth told a story about a man whose children get sold, but then he ends up purchasing his daughter unbeknownst to him when he buys a slave at a later point in his life and then at the the last moment before I guess she starts working in servitude they recognize one another and have this reun reuniting moment and the family is brought back together so it's a, a story about a father and a daughter separated when she was very young who come back together in different circumstances and then have a happy ending 
um, we don't we don't know much more about the content because it survives in such fragmentary form. But we, we have that very, very broad arc. Iphigenia at Aulis, we, we do, as I said, have the full text, but it's notorious amongst academics because the text is in quite poor form. Um, there's lots of what are known as interpolations, which are additional extras that are put into the text by other people. So they might be by scribes inserting extra lines, but more commonly those interpolations are actually by performers. And you get these, these pesky actors who decide that they would like a little bit more showtime on stage and expand their parts and might give themselves a couple of extra lines here and there. Um, and the fact that the play has so many extra lines which are not written by Euripides makes it quite controversial. Some people dislike it for that reason, but I personally love it because it shows this kind of live performance tradition at hand. Um, and Iphigenia at Aulis, we're on very firm mythological ground in that play. It's part of the Trojan War cycle. Uh, and it tells the very first part of the Trojan War cycle when the Greek army is setting sail to go to Troy um, to try and retrieve Helen, who's gone off to, to Troy with Paris. And what happens in this play is the Greek army set sail, but they get becalmed at a place called Aulis. And in order for the, the winds to come back, for them to be able to continue on their voyage and sail off to Troy, Agamemnon, the king, has to sacrifice his eldest daughter, Iphigenia. And the play's all about him grappling with this decision. You know, does he go through with it? Does he not go through with it? He brings her to Aulis on the pretense of marrying Achilles, um, no less. And then re his plan's revealed and um, various things happen. And ultimately, she decides to go willingly to her death. So like Bacchae, it's a play about a parent and a child. And I think it was Edith Hall who was the first person who, who posited that both Bacchae and Iphigenia at Aulis and likely Alcmaeon in Corinth are linked by this parent-child relationship theme where you have a father and a daughter in two plays and then a mother and a son in Bacchae. And it's this relationship upon which a lot of the dramatic action really turns. And linked tragedies are actually linked trilogies of tragedies are actually quite rare. We've got the Oresteia is the most famous example, which tells um, the aftermath of the Trojan War saga, actually, when Agamemnon gets home and what happens. And this one is not linked by plot, this trilogy, but it seems that it is linked thematically. And that um, can maybe help us direct our attention when we, we listen to Bacchae or we watch a performance. If we think about how Originally, it might have been staged in this trilogy, which has this focus on parent-child relationships. It can kind of direct our energies a little. And I, I, I mean, you've blown my mind just a little bit because I either never knew or completely forgot that Iphigenia Dallas was paired with the Bacchae. And that makes yeah. both plays even more challenging and messed up um, <laughs> than I had imagined before. Um, so you, you just mentioned about uh, the staging of the plays, right? So, mm. you know, in an ancient performance, we may even get more interesting in intertextuality between the plays um, by casting some of the same actors, by having you know, some of the same performers involved. Um, before we get to this performance, tell me a little bit about what you imagine ancient uh, performances of this play were like. Ah, oh, wonderful question. So, I mean, I guess the, the truthful answer is that we, we do have to use a lot of dramatic license to imagine what it would have looked like. But we know that, as you said, we would have had a small cast playing the, the main characters. They would have been doubling and they would have been masked. We've then got a larger chorus of between 12 and 15. Uh, and the chorus would probably be on stage for, for an awful lot of the dramatic action. They'd also be masked. What we have in the back eye is some really interesting um, inklings as to the other things that have, might have been going on in this play. Um, there are some significant props in this play um, which show that it must have been quite a, a spectacle to watch. And we also have invitations for kind of oral acoustic um, ingredients for this play as well. So I think there's a tendency for people who, who imagine Greek tragedy for the first time to think of it as very staid and quite boring almost. You've got these people in masks having to maybe speak very slowly because they're in this huge amphitheater needing to throw their voices out really loud so they can be heard. But there must have been quite a lot going on in, in the back eye in particular. Not that I would say that any of the plays are boring, of course, but in the back eye, you've got these 
miraculous descriptions of um, Pentheus appearing to see two sons, for example, when Dionysus takes him up the mountain to view the Maenads. Uh, we've got an earthquake happening when Pentheus captures Dionysus and tries to imprison him. And in order for Dionysus to get out, there's an earthquake. And it's, it's described, we get in the text, um, inklings as to the sounds of this earthquake. And both of these ideas kind of, or these moments invite us or invite a, a director really to kind of stage this in an innovative way. We don't know if there were sound effects, if there were scene paintings, which might've shown two sons, for example, but it's possible. There are dramaturgical invitations for, for these things to be staged. And I mentioned before the props. So we have before the, the parodos, part of the, the chorus, a choral load, before that starts, we have um, a mention of the women having drums. And then when the drum, the women do appear, they mention the drums twice. So we assume that, that there were drums. It seems odd for there to be three references to the women drumming and then the women to not have any drums. Um, that doesn't make so much sense to me. So apparently we've got quite a musical chorus on stage, maybe with drums. Uh, we've also got descriptions of these bacchants or these maenads as um, holding a, a kind of type of wand, which is wreathed in ivy and wearing fawn skins as well. So quite a, quite a striking costume that the chorus would be in. And then at the, the finale of this play, we have uh, a scene which is known as a sparagmos scene, a tearing apart, a ritual disembodiment. And it, I, I perhaps shouldn't, shouldn't mention exactly what happens before we watch, watch the performance in case I'm giving it away to anyone. But there is a really miraculous thing that happens. Oh, miraculous is the wrong word, isn't it? Disturbing thing that happens during this tearing apart. And Agave, the mother, um, emerges from this scene holding a, a really horrific prop in her hands. And this would have been shown to the audience. So it's a play which I think visually and acoustically would have been really very rich. And it takes us far beyond the idea of simply a group of actors in masks standing forward facing an audience and reciting their lines. It would have been a, a rich and wonderful performance. Um, and, you know, building off that. And so your, your visual painting of it is wonderful, right? It's always hard to imagine these things. But when you move from that, from your idea of sort of the, the possible reconstruction of the past and go to modern performance, what are some of the things that you look for in a modern performance? What do you get excited about? What are themes you want to see hit? Um, or what are really the moments that, that you're most eager to, to witness? I um, am possibly going to give a, a dissatisfying answer to any uh, dramatists out there watching who want hints as to what to do, because my answer really is that I want to be surprised when I see a back eye production. Um, and if I think back to or um, imagine back to 405 BC, what the ancient audience saw when they saw the premiere, I think that anyone watching this performance would have been surprised. Uh, I don't believe that we have any definitive evidence which points to exactly what happens to Pentheus in this tragedy happening in any of the, the prior retellings of his family tree that happened um, in other dramatists or other poets' work. Um, just because we don't have surviving sources, though, doesn't mean that there weren't any, of course. There could be lost versions which told that story. Um, but to my mind or from my, my knowledge, this is the play, the only play which tells this version of the plot. Um, it's the first version that this particular plot has been told. So it's innovative in terms of the story. And as I've been saying, in terms of the music, in terms of the stagecraft, I think this would have blown the audience away. And perhaps that's one of the reasons why it won first prize. And so for me, if I'm thinking about what I want to see from a back eye, I want to be surprised. I want to have a, a director or a costume designer surprise me rather than simply stage the play, um, making sure every line is, is delivered properly um, and heard audibly and things like that. Um, I, I do always like to, to see some spectacular moment during that sparagmos scene. I think that um, as a moment of ritual is really interesting and I'd like to see that ritual activity captured. Um, the connection between the Bacchants, the female, the female worshippers of Dionysus, I think sh showcasing some of that ritual is a really exciting thing for a performer to do. 
But there's not one thing that I necessarily want. It's more that element of surprise. And I think the most successful receptions or productions of the back eye do contain that element of surprise and do something new. I don't think we could have a better introduction or setup for the play. Right, waiting for that moment of surprise, waiting to be sort of shocked, to be titillated, um, to enjoy the music, um, but also to be unsettled. Um, so with that, we're going to take you to um, Johanna Warren's and Jay Landon Marcus's performance of the Bacchae. Stay around afterwards. We're going to talk, talk to the artists and our crew um, and see what they've done to us. The ancient blessings of Dionysus Blessed and blessed again are them who consecrate, who concentrate Blessings on them who make the holy rituals habitual Zeus's speed outrunning, mortal eye tore him loose. He was free, safe from Hera's jealous eye. Sewn into Zeus's thigh and brought forth again to birth again. A god bull horned, fully formed, son of light, in joy so bright. Zeus crowned his head with serpents, and now we, the main lads, be his holy servants. Blessings on those crowned with serpents, holy servants, writhing crown, dancing down here to thieves. Thieves who nursed, who nurtured his mother, Semele. Thieves, adorn yourselves with ivy leaves. Thieves, fertile be fertile, crown your heads with berries. Redden with berries. Be the buck and smell my bright curls, feel him pull you. I feel him pull me. Wrap yourselves in curls of braided wool, he courses through. He courses through me. Grasp the wild thyrsus now, behold yourself. Behold, holy now, the wand of God we hold. Behold yourselves, behold. Let the dance begin in golden light. Behold yourselves, behold. 
calls us to the mountain tonight. The band of women waits, driven from their homes, driven from their mates, possessed by him. The band of women waits, hear the holy singing song, sung by Dionysus, everyone. We will run to the mountain, the holy dance has begun. Stretch the primal drum, the drum of mother earth. Stretch the primal drum, the drum of Caves of Crete, where Zeus was born and given form. From Rhea's hand, the drum was made. The holy flute was played. Then stolen by the raving satyrs. Wild with the dance of the creators. It fell at last to me, and we, a company, is dancing now. Holy Dionysus tears the flesh of goats, devours raw the living meats. Delighting as he eats, he calls us running night and day, sweetly calling Evo Hey. Look flows from the earth beneath our feet. Flows, flows, flows like frankincense, like Syrian flame from whence he came. Flame that flows now from his torch, scorching stragglers to go forth. Driving on his dancer's feet, whirling, flickering with the beat. Onward, Buckeye, onward he cries, onward, Buckeye, hey, 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 hey. Follow blazing, small as gold, follow Buckeye, young and old. The drumming, thunderous, roaring, wondrous, becoming one of us. The thunderous, wondrous, shaking, squeaking, picking, again, again, together, woven in forever. To the mountain peaks, shrieking, speaking, crying, flying to the buck and crying, Evo, hey. Tell my 
terrible evil has erupted here Are women going mad before they disappear Leaving their homes to frolic in the woods With a false deity who's up to no good Drinking and dancing is worship they claim For their god Dionysus I curse his name You call yourselves priestesses main as I think Swarm into buckets and hills Intoxicating drink Yeah You think he is a god The blessed son of Zeus But it's no secret that his mother was loose Just the son of the whore And you're all his slots With his evil in your mind His poison in your guts Aphrodite is the one you serve Now your god will get what he deserves I'll sever forever your sordid sororities Obliterate your orgy the enemy of obscenity The enemy, that's me The enemy of obscenity The enemy, that's me I'll track down the rest who are still on the hill Even my mother, I'll get her will The twirling wand, the flowing hair He can't shake his head when his head isn't there He vulgar hearts will forever remain in the depths my dungeon locked in chain Dionysus will answer to me Bring him, let him see The enemy of obscenity The enemy, that's me The enemy of obscenity The enemy, that's me By the order of Apollo The charges are as follows Carousing, obscene, arousing Erotic espousing, libidinous, lascivious, perverted, promiscuous mistresses. I'll slay him with you as my witnesses. My business is to be the enemy of obscenity. The enemy, that's me. The enemy of obscenity. The enemy. In his mortal skull. <laughs> <laughs>
wise, humility is best. See with open eyes, our mortal lives are blessed. <laughs> Victory cry, Buckeye. Oh, Theban women, your spirits fly, soaring to the sky. Come to me and let me see your beautiful duality. The prize to the eyes appears to be a treasure of the wild. The blood on your skin is him. You win. The sacrificial child. <laughs> Now she's running frenzy towards us Agave, mother of Pentheus Welcome, welcome The gods dancer of joy Welcome, welcome Evo, hail Hail, Buckeye of Asia Hail, speak, speak Tell us what do you carry from the mountain peak Happy was the hunting, yes Happy was the hunting we've killed a beast wild and grunting see that what you say is true fellow dancer we welcome you look at the great prize i bring a mountain lion caught without net or sling why was he caught kithiron kithiron butchered him on kithiron a beautiful mess from the wilderness i killed him yes in the wilderness he shall call you After they reached the beast, happy was the hunt. All oh, will share in the feast. Oh, 
flesh with his slaying Or to send him to Hades without ever saying A prayer for his soul without making him whole Wow. Um, I, I'm at a loss for words. Emma, maybe maybe you can help me out a little bit because I'm, I'm just trying to figure out how I can sum up and, and do anything or say anything right now um, really uh, to match what I just watched. I mean, it was just incredible, wasn't it? I feel like it's um, almost un impossible to <laughs> articulate, but... Isn't it just incredible what we were talking about at the start, how you could almost check off everything that we discussed in terms of what we might hope to see. And, it, was all, and, and, it was all there. And just so people know, we didn't actually have any idea what was going to happen. We had a scene list um, beforehand, but we hadn't seen this, right? And we knew it was going to be partially shot. I think it was in a, a wood in Wales and partially shot in the States, I think. From memory, well, Paul can correct us at the end. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, I, I will ask when 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 Johanna and Jay come in, um, we can talk about we can talk about it. Um, but but so first responses. Um, what 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 do you want? What do you want to talk about? What was jumping out in your mind? I mean, the form. I think we we have to start with the form. It is so rare to see <clears throat> tragedy performed as a musical. We see comedy performed as musicals. Um, various, there's been various um, versions of, of Aristophanes, um, Plautus as well being performed as a musical. We see Greek tragedy sometimes performed as an opera, but not really a, as a musical. And I said just before the start of this broadcast that the thing that I like to see with a back eye is something that surprises me, something that does something different. And the, the idea of doing the back eye as a musical, I guess it was kind of almost like a rock opera, wasn't it? But that 
that I think was so impressive, so bold and so unexpected. And yeah. I think, you know, w- yeah. a wonderful congratulations to the director Absolutely. and the, the cast because it was just so impressive and so unique. And that should have been probably the first words of my mouth shouldn't be, shouldn't have been wow, but thank you. <laughs> thank yes. you. Um, but, you know, talking about form, right? So we have to tether to something as classicist. But thinking about form, what I while I was watching this, I was like, is this music video? Is it rock opera? What's happening? And I think that that ineffability, right, that the indescribability of what's happening generically is it, so just a fit for Euripides because every time I read Euripides um, and teach him I'm thinking he just doesn't fit the generic boundaries you might expect from an Aristotle or from a later form formalist what we get is something that that defies those boundaries and that's certainly what we just saw um, as we move from like scene to scene and enjoyed the songs um, what did you think of uh, of the scene selection how, how did that strike you as sort of a different way of viewing uh, the Bacchae? I loved that it was so narrowed in on those really key moments and key moments, not just in terms of the narrative arc, but actually in terms of the connections between the characters. So I mentioned that I, I really like to see the connection between the females, the, the main ads who are coming together to worship Dionysus. And we got those moments, um, which are not really about plot so much. They're, they're about creating a dynamic between a chorus of women. But then we got those really key moments of plot, the agave when she's got the head of her son and doesn't actually know that it's her son. She thinks she slaughtered this beast. And then when she realises exactly who it is and what she's done, we saw those two scenes. And we also had a really nice selection where we had a cross-section of choral sections where we we had the, the women coming together. And then we had the sections which were still sung in this production, but they were protagonists. And that's actually quite in keeping with the structure of a Greek tragedy, the kind of movement between chorus and then a duologue or um, just a couple of characters, sometimes sometimes conversing in lyrics, sometimes in prose and tragedy. But it's that, that movement between the collective and the individual or the duologue, which was actually echoed here. So I think we've got a real yeah. kind of lovely selection, which is true to the dynamic of tragedy on the one hand, but then also does something interesting in terms of how it tells the story. And you know, absolutely. And as it moved from character, to, I mean, from the first shot, I was struck um, by how centered the minds of the Bacchae were in this performance. Mm. Um, because, you know, again, going back to sort of the static experience of teaching the text or reading it, we get so drawn into the plot. Right. Mm. And when I first think about the Bacchae, I think, oh, those opening scenes with Tiresias and Cadmus, which we didn't get, or Dionysus and a lot more Dionysus and Pentheus. And what struck me about this performance was centering Agawe's experience, right? Mm. So much more than we usually get in, in, in place. Um, and it really, it, it, Oftentimes when, when we're discussing it, you see performances, Agawe seems like a dupe. She seems like, you know, just sort of, or, or an evil character. Um, but here she seems so central. It was such a different sort of viewing of the play. Um, did that surprise you or, or were you drawn to other elements of it? That did surprise me and definitely drew me in. And it was so refreshing, wasn't it, to see, see the female experience put center stage in mm-hmm. this production. Because you're exactly right. You do get caught up when, when you're teaching the play in the uh, particularly that scene between Dionysus and Pentheus, um, mm-hmm. where you get Dionysus trying to kind of real Pentheus in and you get this this famous moment of cross-dressing where where Dionysus convinces Pentheus to dress up as a bacchant as a as a main ad and go into the forest to spy on the women and that's a really exciting moment to teach and to read but actually the play is called the Bacchae it's about the the female worshippers that's what the title is that we we know the play as today and so to to be re-putting that at the center and to prize open that that moment of recognition, that moment of realization for Agave when she realizes what has happened. You know, Aristotle, we can take him or leave him, but when he talks about the <laughs> the structure of a tragedy, he says that 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 key moment is that moment of recognition in yeah. a tragedy where the characters realize what they've done. And I mean, maybe Pentheus has that moment of recognition. 
when when he realizes that he, he shouldn't have denied Dionysus his power um, before before he meets his untimely end. But really, it's Agave who has that moment in the play where she sees the head, thinks it's a lion, and then all of a sudden has that unfathomable realization of mm. oh my goodness what have I done and to yeah, really see that being pedestalized and expanded I mean what an opportunity for the performer firstly but secondly what a wonderful opportunity for for the audience to watch that moment being given you know the stage time and the emphasis that it deserves and, and that that those that last song she has when she she's lamenting we, I, I would call it an aria right now mm. not actually looking at the score um really brought to 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 my consciousness what you had talked about about the challenging musicality of your producer's plays how he was really mm. pushing it and i've seen some versions of this before where it's cl- clearly more rock um but the music in this play was, was, was at times challenging and fascinating as well. I think you know people who are listening were like, I want the album now. When's it going to drop? Um, but at the same time, it sort of defied genres. Um, Absolutely. How, what was your response as someone who works in theater and performance? Um, what did the music do to you? I loved the fact that, as you say, it defied genres. You know, I was I was making notes and at the start I thought, you know, oh, this is really heavy on the drums and a cappella and it's um, I like how it's appealing to what I imagine maybe the acoustics and the oral dimension of the ancient theatre might have been. And then you get to the second scene and that expectation is totally turned on its head and you you do get much more of a rock sense that, it, you know, something that sounds like it could have been recorded in a studio with a full band. And that slipperiness of the genre, absolutely, as you say, to me, it speaks to the slipperiness of Euripides' text as well. Um, It's a text which is notorious for the difficulty of its musicality, um, for the difficulty of its meter, the way Euripides tried to cram extra syllables into each line and really test his actors and his performers in terms of their their verbal dexterity. And I felt like the the genre-bending musicality of this production did a similar thing for the audience. It was testing us. It was keeping us on our toes. We never knew kind of which direction this production was going to go in and what an enjoyable experience that was. Yeah, and I mean, it really... from the beginning, having the music there constantly uh, made me think of how different it would have been experiencing on the ancient on the ancient stage, right? With mm-hmm. the chorus coming in, um, and you know, you were talking before about oh, it's not just someone standing with a mask orating, right? There's so much else going on, and this really returns to the life and vibrancy to it. And so, the last sort of question before we get to the um, to the performance, who I want to bring in um, mm-hmm. is, is the change in tone. Right. So one of the things about Bacchae that, that always strikes people when we're reading it is that you know, some of the scenes are pretty funny. Right. And there's a lot of sort of meta theater going on, especially in the dra- in the cross dressing of Pentheus and the play between Tiresias and Cadmus. Um, but this sort of took that away. Right. And just peeled back to that core uh, uh, of the pain of mm-hmm. recognition and what, what have they done? Um, did you find yourself thinking about that as well? Or is this just sort of one of my hangups? Um, sort of this genre problem of the play? You know, I, I do wonder if if I'm saying something which would make me um, be kicked out of the, the the school of classicists or the, the group of classicists, whatever you want to call it. So we, we, can edit, we can edit this later <laughs> if it does. If it, but, you know, I, I didn't miss them. I didn't oh, miss yeah. those moments. Um, and maybe, as you say, it's something about... Um, resolving the difficulties but I don't think it simplified the play by Mm. by taking away some of those um more humorous moments that um maybe make us stop thinking about the darkness of the core story here Um, I don't think it simplified it by removing that maybe because there was so much else going on in terms of what it was doing with genre elsewhere and the the mixing of musical genres but by kind of getting rid of those moments I, I, I wasn't left sad. I, I liked this real focus on the darkness of the story. Um, uh, and maybe, maybe it was a good thing that it was quite snappy um, and it wasn't yeah. two hours of focus on the darkness. Maybe I would have had a different response if it was, um, you know, a durational performance that was really yeah. focused on opening up grief. But at that running time, um, I thought, yeah, it was uh, it was perfectly tuned to a real essence of the play. Yeah, thank you. All right, so uh, Jay and Johanna, would you join us? 
Would you unmute, uh, turn on your videos? Hello. Hi. So as I said before, thank you both. That was just, I mean, just amazing. And, and Jay, we, we had you last year. You helped us with the performance of the Cyclops. Uh, and that was like, I thought that that was earth moving for me. Um, so, but today, I mean, really, you gave us a gift. I would love just to, I mean, ask some questions, some technical stuff, but I'd love to hear some more just from your voices about how, how you went about creating this, this uh, beautiful performance. Do I start, Jay? Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, how creating, it's been a long time in the works. I, I kind of transcribed it like six years ago. I was traveling in Turkey and um, along the Aegean coast and along a lot of the sites mentioned in the play, right? Kind of wandering around Mount Ida and uh, Tmolis and Sardis, uh, kind of scribbling like <laughs> mad through the hills uh, with translations. So, and then it kind of just, I did the whole thing and it shelved it for a while. Um, we did the Cyclops last year and it just it's occurred to me to kind of to revive it and reach out to Joe who um, well just brought the, the spirit into it and the life into it again and we just had this incredible um, back and forth kind of pen pal writing of uh, the show we've written like the entire thing so what you saw was a very condensed meticulously edited uh, hard choices kind of down to the core of it, which I, I loved hearing you talk about. Um, it was, you know, where we landed at, where the kind of main hits, right, um, of the show. Um, but we, yeah, we did write the entire thing over the past nine months and um, we hope to really, to continue and to develop it and explore it. Yeah. Would I be able to jump in and ask, did you, did you write it intending for it to be, to be performed and realized in this format, in the kind of audiovisual, multimedia, online, <laughs> streaming, Absolutely performance. Not. No, of course not. No. I mean, it, it seemed like it was made for the screen. The, I suppose that's the gift of, of the editing room. But it, I never would have guessed that you hadn't intended for it to be a film. No, I was envisioned it as a live performance, you know, in an amphitheater. I think I was in the Asclepion, right, and just imagining it uh, in, you know, in the flesh, right, as it was originally done. Um, and that's why the, with the translation, I say translation, but I really wanted to put it back into a lyrical meter that could be then, uh, you know, used to bring the, the music back into the show. So yeah, lyrically, yeah. Would you talk a little bit more about uh, the translation process and the way you guys went around making the, sort of the lyrics and the music and putting it all together? Yeah, I'm, it, it began with like every translation I could find um, <laughs> and just, you know, read them all, everything. And then I kind of just, you know, I channeled it, went into like almost a trance-like state with it um, for a month or two, right? And it just, I was in Turkey and then I'm gonna hold up in a friend's villa in Florence in the hills for like a week alone. And that's when it really, really hit, you know. Um, but the most, most intimidating part of it, I think Emma probably, I talked about a little, was the, as the, the funeral hymn, the last song that we, discussed because it is actually missing from right the original play from the translation right? it's lost to time right so that was um something when undertaking it, i was had in the back of my mind like oh god this is going to come at some point and i'm going to have to write this scene right and then where's it going to come from and, well if i just write it all up to that point it'll just happen and it did and now i don't even remember writing it and <laughs> thank god because it's harrowing and joe fucking <laughs> ripped it apart um, so beautifully and tragically. I forgot what your question was, Joel. No, it's just the process of like putting, <laughs> putting it together, the music. And so you said you guys collaborated. Yeah, um, same, yeah. Joe, what was that like? Like I, you came into this process, you didn't do the, the, the literal field work that Jay did, um, but but what, what perspective did you bring um, to this? I did do perhaps even more literal field work. <laughs> I was writing the music or also kind of had a very channeling like experience walking around the hills of Wales where I ended up relocating at the beginning of the pandemic last year and Wales is known as the land of song and you really feel this presence like walking around through the trees and the little waterfalls and you just feel this presence of 
fairy energy or something that just lives in the land. And so Jay had contacted me about collaborating on writing the music for this amazing text that he had written. And um, so it was a very new way of working for me, working with, because I'm, I'm a singer songwriter in my own professional field, but then to work with someone else's text and just put it to music was a really new thing for me, but it felt so kind of ridiculously effortless. I would just walk my dogs on the hills with a printed out page of lyrics and it really felt like the music was being gifted from the land and that's very close to the essence that we want to infuse the production with this like nature worship and this very intuitive feminine um, experience of the divine and creation. So yeah, really tried to just make it a, a ritual. Well, and I think it, several people who are watching on YouTube uh, as we're talking about this noted sort of the, the powerful impact of the natural world on, on the video that you put together. Um, so can you talk a little bit about what the filming process was like and the other actors you worked in? Because this is, I mean, we've had some films and video on, on this series before, um, but this is pretty high quality stuff. Um, and it looks like it was an intense process. So how do you go from, all right, I'm going to make Bacchae into a play to we're going to go do a rock opera music video in the hills of Wales and just see what happens. Like, how, how did that come about? Well, we had a lot of back and forth about what to present to you because we knew that this opportunity was coming in October, which sounded like a really long time from <laughs> when we first got the invitations. We were like, we'll figure something out. But um we ultimately decided to really pare it down to these key pieces. Even though we have music written for the whole play now, we just wanted to boil it down and offer something that felt really high quality as basically a proof of concept for what we want to do ultimately. It felt better to us to really concentrate on doing the best we could with less material than kind of spreading ourselves too thin and just presenting a mess. Um, so yeah, we feel like, you know, this is what we were able to do with the time and resources that we had for this particular opportunity, but ultimately we want to realize it as a full length live stage production. So I, I've heard, and, and I, won't, I know we want to ask you more questions about the characters and stuff, but I've heard that you might have a, another clip for us. Yeah, there's there's one that we um, intended to put in the film, but you know, just had to make the final cut. Um, yeah. <laughs> and it's one of my, uh, it's one of my favorite scenes in the show. It, it's when uh, Dionysus first confronts Pentheus, or when he's taken in, you know, to custody, as it were. And um, their exchange, right, which is kind of legendary, and also often cited as inspiration for Jesus Christ and Pontius Pilate's mm. exchange, right? Um, so this has always been a very fascinating scene. And, and um, we can show you the, the music with like a picture. I <laughs> 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 focused on something. Um, but yeah, we intended to film it and it kind of got made the cut. But um, if you'd like to, to, to hear it. Yeah. Uh, let's hear it. it Absolutely. Sure. Um, and it, I, I should say also that it's, you know, me doing both Pentheus and Dionysus <laughs> in the guards, <laughs> um, which was quite an interesting experience in itself. Um, <laughs> I had the longest time trying to find Dionysus, right? The, the whole time I was on this, like, oh my God, I can't find it. I tried like a million different things, right? Approaches. When I hit Pentheus and did his voice, Dionysus was suddenly there. Right, he's like very apparent. Um, Pentheus is like trying really hard. I mean, he's overcompensating for everything in his life. And, um, <laughs> you know, Dionysus, he doesn't have to do anything, really. He's just there, right? He's just um, kind of lets the dominoes fall. Is it, is it, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so this was kind of my vocal breakthrough to find these characters, which is, is, is kind of an interesting experience for me. So, so I, um, Lana, do you have control really? of that? Oh. oh, there it is. Cool. Okay. 
gently as we have returned. They have hunted down your prey. The animal was tame. He did not try to run he away. He held his hand to us. His cheeks flushed as though with wine. He gave us the sign that we should rope him tie and willingly he came. I admit I felt a sense of shame. I told him, stranger, I am not the one to blame. I kept against my interest in his pentheus who ordered you. None of the women you sent to the prison in chains now remains that are gone, broken loose, dancing in the meadows, crying out for their god. The you have found my commands. Untie his hands. We've got him in a net. He won't escape our little pet. Don't let him dance away or pay his debt. Yet, leave us. Well, you are attractive. Uh, what do you know? I mean to women. They would think so. That's why you're here in Thebes, of course. What a flowing mane of hair you have, just like a horse. So supple and so sleek, how it rests upon your cheek. A good grip for wrestling and what dressing you wear. You look as if you're going off to the fair. Such pale complexion, you must take great care in avoiding the direction of the daylight. Am I right? You hunt at night to fill your harems, is it true? Tell me, Mr. Handsome, who are you? Where are you from? Perhaps it's a place you know. Mount Olus, with a thousand flowers Yes, grow. I know. From Sardis, it rises high up in the air. My country is Lydia. I come from there. What compels you to bring these rituals to Hellas? A will of Zeus and by his son Dionysus.
just I love that one. A, yeah, it's it's just really fun. I mean, as, as someone who's dabbled in music in my life, I'm just I'm just blown over by how complicated, how challenging, how sophisticated these pieces are. I just I, I don't know what else to say. Um, it's great work. So before I forget, um, where do you go next with this? Right, so, so what's the plan? If somebody stumbles on this video, um, how do we make this happen? Uh, if somebody wants to give us a lot of money, <laughs> that'd be cool. <laughs> um, right. I, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, we want to bring it to life on stage. That's, I think, both of our ultimate dreams for it is just to perform it live, ideally in Greece at yeah. some point. I would, I'd love doing a workshop, you know, or um, something just to explore it further with uh, other actors and singers that are not just me and Joe, which has been fun and awesome, but well, it would be so powerful to actually have um, chorus and, you know, the characters. And, and we had to cut Katniss and Tiresias yeah. from this uh, version, you know, who have... Uh, yeah. To hear those ensemble parts sung back what, by real people instead of like myself yeah. in headphones on Pro Tools, that's gonna feel really good. Yeah, right. Mm. Well, I mean, I, I completely understand what you're saying about how you, you have more text and you have this dream for the, the full realization of what you've worked on. But I do think what you showed us does stand alone um, as a, a great example of what you're doing. And I, I didn't feel like it was lacking when I was watching it. So in terms of a pitch that you've got to show people, I think it's, it's pretty powerful um, 25 minutes that you've got to, to show people. So I, I have everything crossed for you that um, <laughs> some investors are watching and um, are looking to fund a workshop and some development R&D because, yeah, I, I enjoyed it so much. And the, the idea that there's, there's more to come and to expand upon that, I think is really exciting for an audience as well as for you guys. So Thank you. everything crossed for you. <laughs> True, <laughs> truly. And, and before we sort of move on, because I, I, I could go all day talking to you, to talk you too. Um, it's you. fascinating. But but uh, so uh, Joe, Jay talked a little bit about like how he struggled to find Dionysus and then suddenly he was there, um, which is I think a great way of describing what it's like getting drunk anyway, right? <laughs> it's sort of a Dionysian thing. Um, but I, I mean, I, honestly, I, I was just uh, overcome by your portrayal of Agawe. I think to, to, uh, just an, a really challenging character to get one's head around. And I would love to hear more about like your finding Agawe process and, and what your aha moment was, if there was one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I played Pentheus too. So that was fun. So like me and Jay both had that little wrestle with our own toxic masculine and like embodying that. And then for me, like I, it felt really important to play that last song because of what you two were saying about the connections between the women being focused on and highlighted. And I, I totally agree that that is central and also masculinity feels so key and so complex in this play like I just love this play for its queerness and it's just complex portrayal of gender and sexuality and so it felt really exciting it was Jay's idea for me to play both Pentheus and his mother and that just I was like yes please that is the the roles I feel I was born to play like the toxic masculine and the woman who birthed him and slaughters him <laughs> that's my life <laughs> um, so yeah just to to go to all of those places and just reckon with that like where we're all at as a global society of just you know this like the weight of the patriarchy and the beauty of our natural selves and like then the I think there's like this polarity within the polarity of like toxic masculinity and divine masculinity and like toxic femininity that like this wrathful rage that just wants to stop at nothing to like devour and tear apart the thing that has wronged her like we all like there's just these multiple axes coexisting on top of each other that we all find ourselves at different coordinates of but I think my personal philosophy is like, we're not going to live in harmony until we all explore on multiple um, points of the axis and just 
explore what's in there. And for me to say, yeah, I have pantheists in me and I want to kill him and I gave birth to him and I want to put his dismembered body parts back together. Yeah, just such a deep journey. And um, for me, I guess, yeah, like finding agave felt less um, challenging because that's been most of my conditioned life, like as someone who was born and told that they were a woman and like dated men mostly, like I feel like that has been my relationship to the masculine for the most part is just like mourning and trying to put him back together. Um, but then actually stepping into Pentheus was more of a fun challenge for me to just be like, yeah, I'm an asshole. <laughs> And I, I mean, honestly, though the 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 gender, the the queer issues, and then going back to the environment, environmental stuff we talked about earlier, I don't think you two could have made a better pitch for why the Bakai is still a critically important play for rethinking so about who we are. Uh, yeah, that, yeah. So thank, thank you. you. Um, so yeah, uh, Agawe, can I just say something about Agawe? Um, the uh, this question I've had about her the entire time is why Agawe? Why why is she? Um, why does she the one that has to bear all this in the end? Right? This all the this masculine kind of um, headbutting and you know uh, that was always something I had until and then I heard Joe uh, did you know the that aria? Thank you, Joel. Um, <laughs> And it just floored me, right? Um, it's something I can't even really listen to <laughs> that often, like, that much without getting overwhelmed. The why Agawe, right? And it's just, I think the heart of our, our telling of this play is that the women do carry the brunt of the suffering of humanity, right? Um, and yet they also get to experience the heights of the ecstasy. Yes. The spectrum. Yeah. And I think that is the root of Pentheus's hatred and jealousy and fear of it. It's like he wants to be invited to the party, right? Like, yeah. and he's not, so he just wants to obliterate it. Ooh. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, performing him, I afterwards, I was just like naked in a ball on the floor, kind of just he's like, <laughs> get him out of me. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I mean, Both of us. <laughs> I have to say, I, yeah. listening to you to talk about the process and, and like your interpretation of the play and after talking to Emma, um, just reminds me once again why the, these episodes are so meaningful to me. Like I learned so much from, from the performers and the artists talking about the process um, and, then, and then learning from experts who I don't read as much as I should. So I want to thank you, Emma, J Johanna, Jay. Thank you so much for this. And I hope I get to watch more of it soon. Um, and Paul is here with us um, to tell us what we're going to be doing for the rest of, I guess, the semester, the rest of the year um, to keep blowing my mind. Um, and everybody else's. Paul? And hello, Joel. Hello, everyone. And um, yeah, I just, first of all, want to add a huge thanks to, to Joe and to Jay for this amazing, amazing performance. And it feels kind of really exciting from a series point of view, because this is some, this series started just kind of in response to obviously the pandemic and we were all stuck at home and we we're all just kind of reading a couple of scenes and and then talking about it. Um, and that was really fulfilling in itself. But the fact that it's now able to kind of grow and to host something like this um, and to be hopefully a really helpful stepping stone um, for this sort of amazing project is absolutely brilliant. And um, I, I met Jay through this project because we, um, when we um, uh, staged his Cyclops, um, back in December last year. Uh, and that connection was made through the CHS, through Lana, knowing Chaz, um, who also created the Cyclops um, with him. So yeah, it's just a really kind of lovely point for this series to reach that we're able to expand into this kind of different um, way of performing. Um, we have a, a number of episodes coming up now. So we've been quiet. I think the last one we had done before this was in May. Is that right, Joel? Um, and um, so it's been a, a long wait, but we're now back with what I think is an absolutely amazing lineup, obviously starting um, with this. Um, and I can't um, always promise there be always that much music, that much great editing and uh, work put in, um, but I can guarantee that there'll be some brilliant episodes. Um, in three weeks time on November the 3rd, 
we'll be um, doing a very special performance based around book one of the Iliad. Um, and that will be um, uh, partly in, in uh, ancient Greek, partly in modern Greek and partly in English. Um, and will be taking place in um, a few different countries and uh, very excited about that. Uh, and then we have on November 17th, um, an episode called Goddesses and, Goddesses and the Women of Gods, um, which has been conceived by Leonette um, Noble. Uh, and then Chaz Libretto's play based on fragments um, then takes us into December. On December 1st, we'll be performing that. And we end this mini um, season on December 15th with what we're calling an ancient cabaret, um, which is gonna be a collection of songs, scenes, adaptations, work that's been inspired by um, tragedy, other ancient literature, um, both sort of um, new responses, old responses and, uh, and everything in between. And I think um, it's gonna be a really brilliant season all the way across. Um, just a, a few other things to mention. Um, one of the other aspects of this kind of series and the way it's brought together kind of a, a great community at a time when it's been pretty difficult to have a sense of community um, is um, that we, we've managed to do quite a, quite a lot of outreach work inspired by what we've been doing online. Uh, last year, we launched a competition called uh, Playing Medea, uh, which started off in the US and Canada, and then we also ended up and having the competition in the UK, um, in Greece and in Italy. And in total, we had more than 800 students directly involved creating more than 100 videos of scenes of Medea, which they submitted. And you can see some of the Greek videos actually that were submitted um, on the CHS uh, YouTube page. It's one of their playlists and absolutely phenomenal work that, that students of all ages um, put in. We will be soon launching um, uh, another competition in a similar vein um, uh, and the US um, and Canada um, version of that is going to be called um, Playing Dionysus and it's going to be inspired by um, the Bacchae and I'm sure a lot of people will be inspired um, this evening um, from what they've seen. There'll be more news coming about that and also about um, versions that we, of this competition um, and using other scripts as well that we will hope to be announcing for other countries um, in the coming weeks. Um, and um, furthermore, um, the, um, we have a, a fundraiser that we are currently um, operating at the moment, which is to support some work that we're doing. So we're, we're creating um, shorter videos um, that are exploring scenes from tragedy in, in multiple ways um, to kind of show um, showcase to students sort of all the different interpretations that are available when looking at tragedy. Um, and also kind of drawing on some of the amazing expert analysis from the people who have been joining us during this season. So you can um, have a look um, at that fundraiser. The link is in the video description um, below this video. Um, and we launched um, a prototype with, um, thanks to the help of the um, APGRD, um, and also uh, we were supported by Torch for that. We've received some support from the SES and already had some really fantastic support from people who have been watching this series over the last year or so. So a huge thank you for that. And we're looking forward to um, filming um, a couple of more of those masterclasses um, in the coming uh, weeks. Um, and we'll also be um, soon uh, launching a podcast and um, eventually we hope to be doing some um, in-person workshops when that sort of thing becomes possible. Um, and, uh, and finally, just to add that something that's been um, kind of, I suppose, inspired by um, this series as well is um, I've been working with the British American Drama Academy and um, there is a, a, a new Greek theatre programme that is um, open to um, for applications now. It's an amazing programme which has um, two weeks uh, based uh, in, in London, um, working with practitioners from places like the RSC and the Globe, and also um, with academics exploring tragedy. And then nine days in Greece, um, kind of sort of then seeing things in situ. And then finally six days in Oxford, where we'll, we'll be based at the APGRD. Um, so do um, have a look out for that. I will put the link for that into the YouTube chat. 
Um, but yeah, just to finish up all my announcements by saying again, a big thank you to everyone. Um, and it's really lovely to be back uh, once again with this. Thanks, Paul. Uh, you bring new meaning to the word hustle. Um, all the stuff that, that you're setting out, I know we're going to end up working on in part together. So it's exciting to be around you. Uh, infectious, but in the good way in the pandemic. Uh, we got to close by thanking everybody. Again, Emma, thanks for coming. Jay and Joe, thank you for your amazing work. Um, we have to uh, acknowledge, not have to, we love to acknowledge all the people who make this possible. It's not just Paul. Um, it's not just me. I don't actually do that much, but it is Lana Coley who brings it all together. Our producers, uh, Keith, Len, Janet, Sarah, Director of Outreach, Amy Pistone, the amazing images we get from John Coley um, and from Ali Mar who puts them together on the posters. These are the people who make this possible. Thank you to the CHS for Out of Chaos Theater, Cosmos Society, um, and everybody who's watching. In three weeks, November 3rd, we're going back to the scene of the crime, Troy, Iliad, book one, in least, at least three languages. Um, so everybody stay safe until then. Um, stay tuned, stay healthy, and we'll see you in three weeks. <laughs>